We're live. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the uh, media panel. Um, so I guess we've all been talking about NFTs, and we're going to talk about NFTs as well. But um, hopefully, we're going to uh, approach approach the subject of NFTs with a a more sort of a, a media sort of sort of bent. So hopefully, that will provide a sort of different uh, angle on on what we've heard before. Um, so my name is John Jordan, um, and uh, I do various things. One of the things I do is I'm editor at large at blockchaingamer.biz. Um, and uh, before we do anything else, I guess we will uh, introduce the panelists and they can talk a little bit about who they are and, and what they do um, and their media outlets. Um, so, um, George, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is George Agoragis. I'm the co-founder and manager of eGamers.io. It's a blockchain gaming portal established in... 2018. Uh, we are all about blockchain games and non fungible tokens. Uh, we have helped thousands of players to onboard in blockchain gaming, especially in the early days where things were so tough to onboard someone. Now things are much easier. And we, we are steadily growing. And we are doing media. We are doing, uh, you can find us on YouTube and other social media channels. We pretty much that's all for me. Thank you. Good. Thanks, George. Um, we seem to have lost one of our panelists, have we? Is that right? Or yeah. I trying to add him up right? We lost Andrew. Lost Andrew. Oh, yeah, I'm, sure lost come, I'm sure he'll come back. Okay. <laughs> well, he can, he can introduce himself last. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Leila, do you want to uh, go next? Sure thing. Um, so I'm Leila. I'm the features and opinions editor for Being Crypto. Uh, Being Crypto is a a blockchain and crypto media, uh, news website. Um, we're one of the top five crypto websites in the world, and we've been steadily growing since 2018 when we started. Our focus is on providing um, transparent and unbiased news. And so, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> cool. Good, good. Uh, obviously, NFT is not all about gaming, so maybe you, you'll, you can help provide that sort of angle. Um, Andrew, welcome back again. Do you want to? Do you want to? <laughs> do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what yeah. happened. I just no, uh, no. disappeared. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I started uh, blockchaingaming.com a few years ago, back in the days of, like, Hunter Coin and Spells of Genesis. And it's basically just a portal to different things, like a wiki and a forum. And uh, we do trading and stuff now. I've started an accelerator program. Um, I also like to mint some art NFTs lately. I've been helping some art activists NFT and tokenize their art. Cool, good. And another another tick on the uh, on the gaming side. Um, <laughs> uh, let's uh, uh, Theo. You want to explain okay. what you get up to? Um, so I'm the co-founder of NFTEvening.com, um, which is an NFT focused website covering news of the whole ecosystem whether it's digital art, collectible music, uh, you name it. Um, our goal is to uh, create accessible content and to build one single place to accompany any artist, investor, or NFT enthusiast on their NFT journey. Uh, it's a recent project we just started a month ago, uh, but our publishing company behind it uh, has been you know, operating websites for the last three years. Um, we are reaching like 25 million users a month uh, in like languages 20 different countries so i think i'm probably you know my background doesn't come from crypto but mm -hmm. i think we you know we can help reaching wider audiences and 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 bring good to the uh, nft community um so obviously because my business partner and i are both uh, nft enthusiasts we decided to dedicate some human and financial resources into that project and we hired you know more knowledgeable and and uh, more qualified people than us that are covering uh, these news Good, excellent. That's another tick in the in the uh, generalized NFT camp, um, and our third tick into the gaming camp, Guy. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, yeah. My name is Guy. I'm uh, from CryptonGamers.com. Uh, we were founded in 2018. We're also kind of portal media kind of thing for crypto and games. We also have to onboard people to gaming since the beginning. Uh, had one of the first actual NFTs that we use as a membership, so we also have a little touch on the utility and use cases aspect, and soon we'll be adding a lot of functionalities. So um, looking, you know, for more ways to shed light on this whole NFT thing and give use cases actual light, you know, 
beyond items. But at this point, we're mostly a hub. And uh, yeah, I'm the new director of the brand. So nice to meet you. Good, good. Um, uh, so, and obviously, you know, I guess people people who are watching who want to reach out to the media, these are some of the people um, you should uh, have have in your contacts list, whether that's a, by email or, or Twitter or, or, or the, all the usual sort of things. You know, these are people who can who can get you um, get you kind of attention. I thought maybe to start off a nice a nice thing before we kind of head into the media side of things is for people to maybe talk a little bit about NFT projects that that, that they're kind of personally interested in. I think that maybe shows something of, of the personality. Um, Leila, do you want to go first and just say, has anything particularly caught your eye? Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so recently I actually interviewed a very interesting project that's um, more about outside of what currently is really big, which is obviously art and gaming. They um, are an app that they're an app that is using is making it possible to mint NFTs really simply through their app. And the idea isn't uh, selling it so much at the moment, but more to claim copyright over original ideas and content. So you have a long-term record of something building and contributing to. So if you want to one day, I don't know, copyright it or even have a dispute, there's actually something that you could take with you and be like, there's a record on the blockchain that I made this. And I think mm. that's really interesting because the whole idea of, I mean, obviously the negative response is that they're just a baby a bit useless or not as valid as they seem to be. But this is something that's really quite tangible, I think, to people who maybe are even not in the NFT world. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I think, yeah, I think we've only really scratching the surface of, of, uh, of exactly what NFTs can do. And the people who think they're these little bits of artwork you can uh, screenshot um are gonna have a have a rude awakening um theo do you want to do you want to what is, what have you been interested in um have, have you guys heard about uh, realty tokenizing uh real estate in the okay US? right yeah so yeah, yeah basically i'm you know i live in london and I, you know i've been here for like seven years and i've tried to uh invest in real estate but it's impossible it's too expensive <laughs> and so those guys are basically buying big flats in the us and tokenizing uh, them so you can you know like um, invest in your real estate for like fifty dollars and you will receive your rent uh, directly uh, on your uh, MetaMask so it's yeah it's crazy you know and that was actually my first uh, ERCV sorry ERC twenty tokens that I purchased and uh, yeah it's great has been really great good good excellent that's very different um, Andrew uh, yes I have a collection of ones from games I've played. You know, mm. Probably the the most impressive would be from Gods Unchained. I got some cool cards. Um, there's also some NFTs. Uh, there's a couple in our portfolio from where we trade at our company, and uh, some like what well, they're usually ones with utility, right? We want ones that will have demand, uh, economic demand for them for the long term. Uh, although, like I said before, I also sometimes dabble in ones that are fun for causes. Like my friend also does peace bonds and just cool, wacky things. Like I, I'm into some of those wax NFTs too. Yep, yeah, no, wax not going on that good. Um, Guy. Yeah. So I, I've taken a peek lately. Interested in all the thing about governance that comes with NFTs or community aspect. You know, block uh, cryptongamers.com world community focused uh, hub. So I like the whole thing that now I see with Gary V, the the drops from Gary V and the whole community around that and how community is the main drive behind everything there. Yep. So I picked up a couple of those and uh, <laughs> it was auctioned, it was hard to get in. But anyway, yeah, I think the community is, is the main thing here, you know, like uh, um, uh, NFTs give us um, not just access or a complete ownership of something. It gives us um, it gives us a sense of community, like how we can I don't know we can feel part from this auction, and then after the auction finishes, we can have participate in governance, decide aspects on the actual product or on the project, and I think that's going to affect like greatly about gaming and the future of gaming. Now, right now, everything is so centralized, and I don't know Activision. And all the others, they are just demonizing their users, you know. I guess that if you are gamers, you can all relate to this. I think that NFT is really going to come, come up and solve that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, start, starting with the arts, but I think ending up with the utility. Like, mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to agree. 
uh, I have to agree with Andrew that utility is, is what it's all about. And the arts are just like a platform for everybody to open their eyes to see what this even is. Mm -hmm. no, it is. It's a good point. I think um, that obviously a lot of the headlines at the moment are focused on, on, on financial value. Um, and that's obviously a thing that catches people's attention. Um, but in a, you know, in a very key way, the only reason that these things will have long term value is if there's a community providing uh, the value. And you know, it's interesting. I, I would slightly I would disagree with you, actually. Um, I think I think utility is is does allow communities to kind of coalesce around NFTs, but I, but um, I don't think you actually need utility per se. So I think kind of crypto functions is a good example of something that has sort of has no, I guess, di direct utility. I guess we can say it has indirect utility as people using it as, as Twitter um, kind of uh, avatars. Um, but but the kind of a community has developed around that. So it's not to say kind of there's, there's, there's one way of doing NFT projects. I think I think you know, broadly people find their own way. But I think underpinning it all you're exactly correct like community is the thing is the thing that that uh, makes nfts valuable financially and also um emotionally and and it's also, also different, different values as well. um george i imagine you've got wallets full of nfts <laughs> what, what, what another, NFTs are you, are you interested in? A lot of wallet. Yeah, uh, another so wallet. John, uh, there are many, uh, I could say, interesting NFT projects out mm. there, right? right? Uh, one, one of the projects that really caught my attention lately is uh, Vulcan Fort, uh -huh. which is it's a grow, I, I believe you know it, it's a growing ecosystem. And they do have some great stuff uh, in the making. Uh, I, I believe recently they teamed up with Frank Frazetta and they are releasing some art stuff which was sold for like uh, millions in real life but the the interesting thing is the inter interoperability of the system that they use vulcanite nfts across all the all the games that support vulcan forged plus they are actually going to release the first mmorpg on the blockchain. I mean, there are many MMORPGs that are under development, right? But no one has actually released the game. So I think the beta is coming very close and I'm really pumped for this project. I really like this. But yeah, there are many interesting NFT projects out there that we could talk endless about this. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's good. It's good that you, obviously you all chose sort of, sort of different projects there and had different, slightly different approaches to it. And I think that that goes to show that that NFTs are are much broader than than I guess the majority of people would think, and that right. probably probably even even NFTs will go much broader than than than, than even we kind of imagine at, at the moment. Um, and I've always been surprised in the last kind of couple of years, really, how, how we've seen just a lot of kind of IP companies, um, you know, taking NFTs as, as a sort of brand extension to what they're already doing in in the physical world, in the digital world. We've had kind of talk in the games world of like Sega doing its first NFT drops. Um, we've got some Olympic stuff going live um, next week with Animoca Brands. We've got stuff like Dr. Zeus coming in. Yeah, it's, it's kind of brands I wouldn't necessarily would, would be would be like, you know, be in the vanguard of putting things on a blockchain. It seems like, you know, actually quite a lot of these kind of fandom um, projects, as we call them now, um, all of them are, are coming onto the blockchain. And so NFTs will be... Hopefully the name will go away. I don't think it's a very nice name personally, but um, hopefully um, we, will, we just see digital items um, will be something people can, can own and trade. Um, so we have questions coming in, so that's really good. We will come to the questions. Oh, there's loads of them. Um, and and the uh, the best question will will be rewarded with with a uh, NFT. Not quite sure what that NFT is, but the organisers of the conference um, will be sorting that out. So keep the questions coming, and we'll kind of uh, crack onto them. Um, okay. Uh, but but uh, as we are a media panel, um, I kind of thought it would be good to at least touch on that and and um and sort of discuss i guess a little bit about our we have different audiences i guess um particularly uh, uh leila and theo um do, do, we, do we think our audiences are you know how, how do we think they they are looking at nfts do we think that they sort of understand the deeper consequences are they are they really worried about some of this, this stuff about sort of climate change and and, and you know obviously been a big sort of backlash in some uh, kind of communities around around running NFTs on, on Ethereum. Um, Theo, do you want to go first? You have quite a broad audience. I mean, do, do you think people understand it, or is it sort of just seen as a, still a sort of get rich quick sort of sort of mentality? Well, I I guess they probably understood you know the top of the iceberg, but they are missing lots of applications. So you know, like um, I think because the mainstream media lately talked about you know people's sales, you know everybody heard about uh, crypto art and 
and the fact that you know you can prove your ownership uh you cannot be counterfeited but you know i mentioned realty before and this is an application in the real estate and, and I, you know can miss that uh but the fact is that nfts uh like as opposed to crypto they are touching a, a wider audience it's so diverse uh, it's fun so people can come from uh you know different horizon like i mentioned music collect me and there was uh, this guy that was doing an interview on on Bank bankless podcast uh, recently and he said nfts are like a trojan horse for uh mm -hmm. crypto so it basically is the first step for them about blockchain and and, and bitcoin and ethereum so yeah I, you know i think we just need to you know in in the crypto world everything uh, is about decentralization but i think for content and if we want uh, the nft ecosystem to grow uh, mainstream we need to centralize the information and make it accessible the, the content being accessible itself but also the the medium the the, the information is everywhere at the moment uh, you know all the marketplaces have their own um you know, Discord channel, Reddit group, and if you want to get exposed to that information, you need to subscribe to 100 groups. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, you know, centralizing information would do good to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah, that's good, good. Uh, no, it's definitely the case that, uh, that uh, NFTs um, are a lot more, a lot less abstract than sort of tokens. I mean, tokens obviously attract a certain sort of trading, sort of, uh, sort of community who've been in crypto for, for, for forever, um, whereas NFTs, uh, I guess kind of make it a bit more as you say find a bit more they own this thing whether it's artwork or, or music or something that, that makes it a bit more kind of relevant to people um guy how, how do you think your audience um is reacting to nfts um so, yeah like i said before you know um and like you agreed with me community plays a big role you know at first uh, i think it's just a drive for adoption you know gaming it's it's a huge multi-billion dollar industry i think everybody it's, it's, everybody's already noticed that that's why there's so many companies sparking up every single day you hear about the next gaming uh, like blockchain game and uh i see i see just how the community can affect the result of all this you know internet phase you know when just like when the first game developers were doing it from their home then they started these companies and then it all turned to a big startup bubble you know, because gaming drives innovation. You know, that's the way I see it. That gaming now is like a gateway. It's going to be untapped. It's untapped potential. They're just waiting there. And the moment that we cross this threshold that gamers understand NFTs and NFTs represent ownership of their accounts, their packages, you know, like their tiers of their accounts, not just the items and their interactions with each other in, in the community as governments in their guilds or in their tournaments and whatever, then we're gonna see like a flood. And the moment that that's, that's, that threshold is passed, I believe there's not gonna be any turning back, you know? Once we pass this threshold, there's not gonna be turning back because once a new like standard of verification is accepted and adopted, then you never see uh, organizations turning back. You know, I can tell you from the executive space that once something is adopted as a standard, it, you're not going back, <laughs> right? So I can really see like how communities, you know, let me just uh, uh, track back here. Krypton Gamers really started as a cool place to hang out, you know, for gamers and to onboard gamers to blockchain. And I think that it's a very, very big mission. It's an undertaking because um everything that i just said you know the moment that the bridge will be crossed then countless of use cases will be poured in and they're going to be so obvious to everybody right now it's like the next uh, hidden thing that people are looking for the hidden utility it's going to be very obvious soon that's my mm -hmm. opinion yeah yeah but i think I, I think that's sort of what lots of people in the community sort of think about sort of gaming so gamers sort of in inherently get that they have in-game items because that's you know, it's no game if you don't have a character in the game and you don't go and flex swords or you don't have a car and you get new kind of items to, to tune it up, then there's no game. So I think there is this idea that gamers sort of inherently get digital objects and they almost sort of inherently believe that they own their stuff at the moment, even though clearly they don't and they you know, right. can't le legally trade it. But they, they sort of feel that they they should be able to because they paid money in Fortnite. Why can't they then trade that stuff? So I, I do think that, I agree with you on that point. There's this interesting connect with gamers will just sort of get it. 
and as long as soon as you allow them to trade stuff, then why would they go to a game where they can't trade stuff? You know, so. yeah. And yeah. it's a huge um, community. Well, Gamers yeah. are, are big, yeah, yeah. big, you know, they're a big uh, yeah. pile of people, you know. And we mm -hmm. helped drive the previous innovations, you know, mm -hmm. the switch to mobile and the development of uh, so many use cases in the internet and the drive of uh, video cards and accelerators and GPUs and CPUs. I think that gaming is a huge drive in innovation and technology. And it's kind of overlooked always because it mm. uh, seems like uh, just entertainment, but it's so much mm. more than that. Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, Leila, coming at it from a more more generalized sense, I mean, obviously, kind of NFTs in twenty twenty one have been this big explosion. Certainly, I didn't kind of foresee that happening in, in the way it did. Um, how, how have you kind of felt sort of covering, you know, covering it from a more general point of view and having to deal with sort of art and music and, and, and all this sort of stuff? And what's the audience reaction? Sort of, do you, do you feel like they just wanted to know more about NFT projects, or are they sort of a bit? Got too much now too much nfts <laughs> i mean the nft topics still continue to be some of our most read articles so i don't think that there's really been a slack of an interest actually it kind of at anything is just even increasing i mean our content is but i mean we've so our website has really intense feature image graphics and we've even had readers ask if we're going to make those into nfts so they're mm. definitely in um, from our audience and I think since our audience is quite broad like it's not just gamers and it's not just people who are in, intensely into crypto I actually think that maybe of our audience are people who are reading these, reading these NFT articles and maybe are not even that involved in crypto or even have NFTs they just want to know about this thing that everyone is talking about seemingly at the moment so yeah I mean I think that there's a lot of interest, it keeps growing, and also as we keep it, it's the what there is to write doesn't actually cease at all. Like we cover, I think literally yesterday I covered a thing that was a roundup about ways NFTs are being used, and it was really extensive. And I mean, that's just going to carry on going, I think. And so, yeah, good, absolutely. Um, Andrew, you want to talk a bit about, I mean, you said you were working with some sort of, uh, kind of minting some stuff as well. I mean, what's the audience around that? How do you build community around that? Uh, it depends. Uh, for games, uh, people want ones that they think are going to be fun or ones that they think are going to let them play to earn, either mm -hmm. or. Um, for more artistic NFTs, I do like... People are more interested in things that appeal to them, like as a meme, or that appeal to them in some ideological or political way. Um, and that's kind of cool. So we market in that way. I do think like when you brought up the environmental thing, I get so tired of hearing that because even if we, uh, even if we don't go into proof of work and the validity of accusations against proof of work, which is something we could, I think it's kind of irrelevant for the reason that a lot of NFTs don't use proof of work, right? <laughs> Wax, uh, Dapper Labs, what the, what's that? The Flow blockchain and soon Ethereum don't use proof of work. And so that argument has an expiration date, which I think makes it kind of silly to have um we can see there's basically a lot of markets a bit irrational right now and uh it's similar to like the ico heyday and similar to that what i think is going to happen is the buzzword and its appeal as one will eventually collapse but it will not so we still have icos we just call them ieos <laughs> or ideos or something but that's there's still icos okay but and it's, just, it's the same thing that's going to happen with NFTs, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And that's fine and uh, healthy, in fact. That doesn't, it's, they're going to be important. We, we own some in our fund, just, uh, you know, not crazy speculative ones. You know, that's why I target ones with utility, because those are more resilient to hype crashes. Yeah. Yeah, we've definitely seen that, I guess, with some of the uh, pricing. And I guess it's, it is interesting, going back to our community thing, it, you know, the fact that anyone can mint an NFT and, and set it for some crazy price. Um, and that seems like at the top of a boom that that's like, well, that's great. You can buy it and then you can, you can immediately sell it for more. 
Um, but even if it's say like a, a famous you know celebrity or, or influencer creating that NFT, if their community actually isn't sort of connected to NFTs and blockchain, the fact that you've sold something for a million dollars, they've someone sold it for a million dollars. If there's no one to then do the next trade, then obviously you know there's nothing there. There is actually no community. And I guess one of the big issues for me around this sort of big boom we had with NFTs was that we had these very expensive items being sold, but there was no. I think it's fine to have the million dollar items, but you have to have ten dollar items as well because that builds the community. You start off just wanting to own what you know whoever the celebrity is or something that they've minted. Ten dollars is fine. Don't, it doesn't matter if the price goes to zero, but that sort of gives the foundation to then create these these more expensive ones. And I guess with CryptoPunks, you know, the obvious example, all given away for free. <laughs> so, so that was really um, that really built the community because they were just they were just freebies. And I think it's still like over sixty percent of those CryptoPunks are in wallets haven't been used, even though these things are now selling for tens of thousands, fifty thousand, millions of dollars. Um, okay, so we're getting some good questions in now. So I'm trying to kind of pick up the ones that I um, think sort of are appropriate to us. Um, so one 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 I like here, and I, I kind of think NFTs sort of play into this idea of of, of us as kind of a uh, kind of people who collect things. And I don't know if we're all collectors now. I, I think sort of societies move, pop culture has moved to, to to being something that you know collecting used to be seen as quite odd, a little bit sort of um, obsessive. And now I think we probably all all sort of collect things. I can see Theo's got sort of a collection of Sonic in the background there, a few a few sort of collection things there. And I guess that's you know I have a few things as well. So so do we think? Um, have people been surprised that, that sort of this kind of collectability, just the effect you can collect stuff, has been enough utility for the NFT boom? I guess NBA Top Shop, I don't know if anyone collects those. Um, but, but generally, all these things, a lot of the NFT stuff is just about collecting. It doesn't really, we don't actually really need, you know, um, it's good to have utility about around these NFTs, but sort of collection seems to be enough. And to get a complete set seems to be, um, do something into our brain. So this question uh, from Upland Dude. Um, has the NFT boom created a new homo species called homo NFT collectus? <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is quite good. So is anyone, anyone, I'm not going to ask everyone all these questions now. Um, so we'll go for a bit faster. But does anyone have any views on sort of collectibles and, and, and how um, the role that NFTs and collectibles play? Who wants to jump in? Are you Andrew, are you you gearing up for something there? Yeah, I don't think it was it. surprising just for the reason that uh, my mom used to trade Beanie Babies. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know about Beanie Babies, but like when I was a kid, she'd like drag me to her silly conference. And actually I was cool with it because other people at the Beanie Baby conference had Pokemon cards. I, mean, I wanted those, mm -hmm. but really she was buying and selling Beanie Babies and she had a good empire going. Mm -hmm. I think it was that purple one that was worth the most. And then that green little bear was pretty good. To, anyway, you get the point. People have been into that. Like how much does it cost? To, to stuff one of those toys probably way less than we were selling them for um and that's there's probably incidences from before that people with stories from baseball cards from decades ago i mean i don't it's new in in its innovation but not in its appeal to human nature is anyone else is anyone else collecting anything at the moment in the, in the nft world Anyone not, going, to, going to admit no. to collecting anything? <laughs> not in the NFT war, but everything that is uh, um, basically video game related and reminds me of my childhood because we don't have you know uh, enough time to... I mean, I don't have enough time to play video games anymore. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think it's a good point. And if I can add the fact that obviously humans like to collect things, um, and I think brands have understood that for a long time. Like if you think about, you know, lecture brands, they, they all make their items. I mean, some of them, like I'm thinking about Supreme, they are, you know, making their, limiting the edition of their um, uh, the, their clothes. So basically, human will always collect. And as long as, you know, NFTs will remain unique, rare, or, or scarce, I mean, human will continue to collect things. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's good. The limited edition point is very good that we see that now. Nothing to do with blockchain. Just in general, general sort of retailing now is, is you would have you know anything would be you know from sneakers to chocolate bars, a limited edition. That sort of that's not collection in the same way in terms of chocolate bars. I guess maybe some people do collect chocolate bars. I don't, I don't know. Um, have big fridges full of things, but uh, but it's just a that, that, you know it kind of plays into the way that we consume things now, um, which is a, you know, an, an interesting point. And uh, I guess that's what you know, in, you know I, the say the Sega the Sega announcement they was doing NFTs while some people really hated it i thought was was an interesting first step for a company that has loads of really loved 
games and brands. Um, and and you can imagine as you have a little you know little Sonic there. I don't know if they're going to be doing Sonic NFTs to begin with, but why wouldn't people be collecting? You know, of course, people collect Sonic NFTs. If you've got a Sonic statue, why wouldn't you collect a Sonic NFT? And I think it will be an interesting challenge for games companies because obviously the big one is Nintendo. Nintendo, can you imagine a Mario collection of NFTs? I mean, you know, <laughs> just just an ability to print money. But clearly, Nintendo probably not going to do that. But but over time, you know, all those you know any IP that has an audience around it. I can't see why that wouldn't become at least a collectible series, maybe not a, a, a game in that sense. Anyone else want to want to talk about collectibles? Yeah, I can Go jump on from that. I on think it. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I was going to say, I think that um, NFTs and in general the, the new technology that we're all uh, so in love with lately, and it's grabbing so much attention. It's because of the higher level of verification of authenticity. I think in the end, it's not just about, um, let's say, gaming collectibles or art collectibles or just cards or whatnot. Th this would be like the first gateway, like I said before. And I think that, um, yeah, humans, uh, at, like as a human nature, we collect things. You know, you collect, when you become wealthy, you collect apartments, you know what I mean? Like, you, you find what to collect, the bigger you get or whatever you, your interest is. I was collecting guitars, you know? <laughs> and a big, huge collection of guitars and studio worth like a quarter million dollars that I never use anymore. You know, it would be cool if that would be tokenized, and that would be could be traded or, or that could be at least you know, open for the public in a VR gallery. Or there is so many aspects to to just the uh, blockchain representation of items, the real world ledger of items. That's how I like to call it. So I think yeah, this is just like the how you said in the beginning. This is the 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 orange pill. You know what I mean? Like this is just the orange pill for people to to start begin to understand the new nature of collectibles, the new nature of verification of authenticity of any item or anything that they own even. So this is just the the, the beginning. Good, good. Cool, good. Let's move on from collectibles. So uh, one for, just go for George in this one. We've got quite a lot of questions about games, um, but if you have questions about other things, put those in as well, please. Don't be too game-centric. Um, so George, it says, uh, gaming NFT value is mainly based on in-game rewards. Um, how are these rewards funded? Are they viable in the long term? So I guess that's the idea that um, we're starting to see now. Um, you know, NFTs based around, this is kind of utility NFTs, I suppose. And you can, if you sort of level them up, they get more valuable and, and maybe you earn kind of things in the game. I guess we've seen that with Blancos now. They have their sort of party pass, battle pass sort of system where you earn yeah. sort of in-game NFTs and stuff. Um, so I guess the question is in the long term, if we're sort of giving away all this stuff, and I guess it's similar for, for cryptocurrencies, do we just sort of end up uh, sort of blowing up the economy at some stage when more people come in, more of these things are being given away, that sort of drives down the price? Do you, do you think, I guess, do you think game companies can work out a blockchain economy with NFTs that, Sort of doesn't end up with the same problems we have with sort of World of Warcraft, where gold becomes, um, you know, uh, worthless in the end. Well, Jana, um, I believe this answer gets uh, like this question has multiple answers. Uh, in the end of the day, it comes down to the in game economy, right? I mean, we, we talk about an NFT, whether it has value or not in the long term. But uh, let's say you have an NFT with the metadata that as you progress, this NFT gets better and better with better stats and it, it, its value grow, right? But if the player base of the game uh, drops, the value of, the, of that particular NFT will go down. I mean, we, we saw this uh, multiple times since the early days of <clears throat> blockchain gaming. Uh, and one example of this could be my crypto heroes, for example. You remember my crypto heroes that once it was leading the space. They were selling land plots for thousands of dollars. People got that land plots, but right now my crypto heroes is not playable. I mean, it, it doesn't have many players. So, it was back in the days to sell your NFTs and get out of the game. I mean, yeah, they are doing some stuff now with MCH Plus and they're trying to bring value back and all that stuff. But in the end of the day, it comes down to the game. Can you create a sustainable economy that it will last for years? Yes, your NFTs will get appreciated. But uh, as we see all these years, uh, 
it, all games come to a point that uh, players quit, either because they are bored or because we are not talking about games. Like most of the games are gamified blockchain uh, dubs. They are not real games. We are we're a few years away from having real games and having having masses mass IPs joining the blockchain gaming space. Because right now most of the games we see are gamified experiences. But yeah, they there are NFTs that can be appreciated that can retain their value in time, but uh, it has to do with the project. And mm. I'll give a piece of advice to our uh, viewers that whenever you want to invest uh, into a game, uh, always remember that it's a game and you have to treat this as a game. Uh, an NFT that might bring yield or it might allow you to kill the, the best boss in the game. Uh, it's not guaranteed that it will have that value in a couple of months. So always be extra careful because we are talking about indie games and indie games come and go all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pick up a few things you said there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to disagree with some of them. So, uh, obviously, not investment advice. <laughs> Never investment advice. I, it's going to, it's interesting because, because I guess as media outlets, often we can just write about something and people can take that as an investment advice, even though it's clearly just written as, as news or something. You know, this thing's yeah. happened and people, people are just like, oh, should I buy this? It's like, well, I don't know. Should you? Um, but uh, but the, the game side of things, I've always thought the, the kind of the rule of thumb is obviously you know, we never invest anything more than you can lose. I mean, that sort of goes goes, goes for anything. Um, but it, I think if you buy a game, for me, if I buy a game NFT because I like the game or like the artwork, then then you you can't in a, in a way you sort of can't lose because you kind of you like the project, you 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 bought some stuff. And actually, my Crypto Heroes is a great example you brought up there, George. I really love the artwork there, so I've actually got quite a lot of of those nfts just because i think the pixel artwork is really nice yeah uh, i don't play the game i just you know occasionally go look at the prices and buy ones that i like so i think that's you know i think and i and so from that point of view i don't really care if the price has gone down um you know i probably spent a few hundred dollars buying these things but i just like them as bits of art so so you know the people who go piling in as you say sort of buying land for tens of thousands of dollars because they think it's going to make them a millionaire i mean that's that's where the problems um kind of really start yeah also, it's one. Come, you get you go yeah, it won't. Like, uh, take for example, Axie Infinity. Mm. Axis back in the day used to cost what one dollar? Yeah, ten dollars. Yeah, now now you have to pay uh, like uh, twenty two hundred bucks to get an axe. Mm. You need one thousand dollars, which let's be honest, one thousand dollars is money in some countries. It's mm. two months payment. For other countries, it's like three days work, but in other countries, you work two months for this kind of money. And you work, you give one k dollars to get just a team that it's not a killer team, actually. You just pay that money and hope you can win some games and grind the daily SLP and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, where is Axie going, for example? Are axes mm. going to cost uh, like one thousand dollar each in the future, or they are over appreciated and they will fall, uh, fall in price if the SLP price, for example, goes down in the future? So you don't know what is going on to happen, and that's why I treat games as games. Mm. Are you going to buy a new game that costs uh, sixty bucks? All right, spend that sixty bucks in a blockchain game. Do not spend more than you can afford to lose us, John mm. said, which is the golden rule, yeah. regardless of what the media says. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have, we have a whole, whole podcast about Axie Infinity. We won't, we won't go into that. Um, so, yeah, I, I've got a actually good question here. Where's I find it? Okay, so um, one, one for Leela, uh, picking out sort of the non game stuff. Although, if you want to jump into the game stuff, that, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, so, uh, this is Marco uh, Penna. Um, so, saying, uh, um so he's saying this is uh, i guess kind of nfts are are the biggest fusion of all time on the internet gamers crypto lovers nft lovers um uh you know and I, and I guess probably all of us are quite kind of kind of bullish on on blockchain in general otherwise, otherwise we wouldn't be in this space um do we get sometimes a little bit carried away like like suggesting that for every every problem the solution is blockchain um 
where do you kind of where do you kind of sit on that? Well, it's a bit difficult because I'm also involved, but I do have a foot in the totally not as well um, as I'm. Uh, yeah, so I think that we do in the space love turning to blockchain and being like, this is the answer. NFTs are like the revolution that is going to bring everyone or something like that. And I mean, I'm not denying that there's definitely more interest from people who are not involved in crypto who um, who have like about NFTs. That's not the case. But even talking about um, even talking about the collective thing, saying that it used to be some weird part of the world, and I'm kind of like for some people, for a lot of the world. NFTs is still a weird collective corner, not actually this like universe kind of that we feel it is. So um, I definitely think that it's NFTs a great way to bring people in and people, I mean, even if it's just by being a bit against, that they still know about it and they can maybe be converted. But um, yeah, I think in some ways we do get a little caught up in our own hype and are, uh, and I mean, the world's a lot bigger, especially the countries and people that can actually be involved. I mean, even just mentioning the aspect about a thousand, I mean, most of the world can't afford it. What is mm. the space? So, yeah, I mean, uh, whether it's or not is a whole other question because, I mean, create the future, I would say. So, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of what I think. Yeah, I think. I think for me, it's definitely the case that I'm very bullish on blockchain, but that doesn't mean I'm very bullish on all blockchain projects. It's, I think there is a sort of a winner, not necessarily winner takes all mentality, but obviously there's, there's a book wherever there are hundreds of blockchains out there. I don't think we need hundreds of blockchains. I think, you know, I think most people think that'll boil down to a sort of a, a smaller number. And I think the same with games and, and, and other projects, you know, we, there will always be more things launched in this sort of early stage period than, than can actually sort of find an audience. And, and I guess that's where um you you kind of the, the the kind of success goes to a few cases not 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 to all the cases um okay let's uh, get one for uh, andrew here about so this is a question from edwin um a big part of, of having in-game assets um is you can sort of sell them outside the game uh do you think games will collaborate to reuse nfts interoperability doesn't that make the latter game sort of lose money because they can't sell their own nft so if i kind of reframe that i guess there's a broad question in blockchain games we've always talked quite a lot about interoperability they're taking an nft asset that's minted in one game and using it in another game we haven't really seen a lot of that um from my personal point of view um do we do, you know do you think that that will be a big thing in blockchain gaming um because because you can't really do it without blockchain so that's something we should we should be doing more of or, or is that just a bit too complicated in terms of sort of game companies having to collaborate I mean, in quite a specific way um no, I think interoperability is, is fundamental for NFTs and the reasons for implementing them. I, I also had some thoughts about a previous question, if you don't mm -hmm. mind, um, the one about where the value of NFTs and games comes from. Because my answer is going to be a, like framed as a market maker. Although on a fundamental level, I agree with George that uh, money enters the game economy through players, if not directly, then indirectly. But technically, there are two main ways we see of what's, you know, how coins hit the market. Um, and one is uh, new players issuing buy orders, so new money entering the market from other places. The other is uh, when we start talking about human mining, you know, is tokens being created within that game economy itself. Like uh, there's some games, like there used to be one called Motocoin and it was proof of play, which is kind of like proof of work or proof of whatever mm -hmm. you mine to uh, transactions through playing. So the coins, the new money is like being printed essentially, you know, just like it would for any other coin. Um, but yeah, in terms of interoperability, I think that's kind of mostly the point of NFTs for games. And people have been doing that for a while. And there are some there are some games I've played that do that. Um, I used to be into Serotobi, for example, which crossed with Spells of Genesis. Um, there are a lot of different examples. I just can't think of any off the top of my head. 
Yeah, and the, the engine ones, for example. Yeah. The multiverse games. You have the operability there. I guess what's interesting is, is for me is I guess the more the more interoperability you have, the sort of the less freedom potentially a game designer has because they're having to design around assets they don't have control over. So so I guess the, the idea might be interoperability is sort of great, but it actually maybe lessens the experience. It's interesting, George talking about we don't have any real games, which is <laughs> a very a very gamer thing to say. Any any game is not a real game unless it's <laughs> unless it's kind of a World of Warcraft. Um, but uh, but I, I think you can. I guess we did have back in the day. We had the had Kittyverse, which was um, you know people taking crypto kitties, which you couldn't do very much with apart from breed, and then having very simple mini games based on them, um, which was kind of functionally worked, but um, didn't really gain a lot of audience. And I think that was because those experiences were not not very very engaging, other than the fact that they sort of existed. Um, I guess that's the barrier for interoperability that I, that I, that I see. Um, I think developers yeah. are more concerned than players about that issue. Okay, in that. Uh, like we all want to move our assets around, but some of them want to wall their gardens and protect mm. IP, um, which is definitely a struggle. And there is a big, I mean, in that question from, I um, can't remember who it was from, but uh, it Erwin, um, you know, a, a way in which game developers make money is to is a primary sale, a pre-sale, you know, minting their own stuff. If a, if a developer can't do that, then how, how do they make money? <laughs> you know, all they've got then is, is someone trading through a marketplace, which is a sort of different model. So, um, so there is a there is business cases as well. Um, let's move on. So, Marisa has asked lots of questions. So, I think we should we should go and uh, answer one of her questions at least. And it goes back to what we were originally talking about, um, community. Um, she says, I think community will play a role which cannot be overrated. Um, so, what do we think about part of the community in, the, in this new world? So again, a sort of broad question, maybe rehashing what we've already said. Um, so, uh, do we go to uh, kind of Theo? How how do you think that we can sort of improve uh, or kind of accelerate the, the role that sort of NFTs can play in sort of building communities? Well, I'm kind of going to repeat myself, but I think you know, like that was my intuition when I started to learn about NFTs. Like, I had to subscribe to so many things just to get exposed to information. Uh, you know, so many you know Discord channel and and I, I always remember my parents, like they are crazy about art. You know, they go to the museum once, once a week, they buy lots of paintings, but they don't know about, about those things, those social media. They are not, you know, digital native, um, hmm. but they read the newspaper. So, you know, if, if we want to uh, reach a wider audience, then we have to make the medium more accessible. I mean, obviously, you know, all of us who are assisting this conference, we, we know about these social network, uh, uh, and these things. But if we want the NFT ecosystem to grow to a wider audience, then we have to think about those people. And, and, and yeah, that's why we, we decided to build a, a, a website which was centralizing all the information and m trying to make it accessible. Hmm. And this is kind of anyone to jump in now. Um, so we actually have another question, which we can probably link into it, um, from uh, Lucas saying about... Um, Every project had its own Discord or Telegram. However, we're limited to 100 channels, for example, on Discord. I'm already on my second account to keep up with projects. Um, so I guess, as you were saying, Theo, there is this sort of overload. And personally, you know, I don't really like Discord very much <laughs> um, because every 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 kind of project has its own massive list of, you know, channels and, you know, you, you, you know and, and every community also tells, says about how many tens of thousands of people it has in there. But I kind of wonder if a lot of them or well, majority of those people have just sort of joined the Discord and never really look into it, which is sort of what I do because it's just yeah. too overwhelming. I mean, do we actually need sort of better better tools? Because community, if you're really into a community, then yeah, you want to go into every little detail. But most of us sort of want to know, you know, it's, it, it, maybe an email list is sort of the, the kind of level of information that actually sort of you need, you know, maybe sort of a once a week, once a month sort of thing. You don't need to know every little tiny thing for every product all the time. Um, go on. Uh, uh, Guy, what do you think about, you know, do, do, we, do we have the wrong tools for building community? Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, things like Discord or, or any other channels, I, I can agree with you that when you find some project, you end up with like a, a new eight contacts, like a list of eight new socials that you got to follow and channels and right, whatnot. And in the end, yeah, I can agree with you. I also, I also, John, I don't look in the Discords so often, you know, and you get to the point that you're just exhausted from information. So I can really relate to this question from uh, Lucas. 
um, yeah, we, we are like oversaturated. And I think that uh, you should just, you know, focus on visiting the, the project webpage, you know, focus on looking into that newsletter, just like John said, you know, the weekly summarized detail, like Decentraland. Jump into the world, look on the, on the plaza, just look on the screen, what are the big events that are published, you know? So look for the uh, kind of concentrated regions where you can find information. And I think we, we could improve in that, you know, all the pro projects could improve in that. We kind of all fall into this template that in order to appear professional or to appear proper, we got to fill out this list of socials. But yeah, it could be more, more practical, more human nature. And I think that, like we said before, I think it really connects, like you said, to the question from uh, Mauricio, Um that, yeah, community does play a huge role in all of this. So uh, should be a way to get the information better. I guess all of, all of you and people back at home watching can agree that you all have too many Telegram groups that you're at that you don't check, right? Mm -hmm. All right? So your all Telegram is terrible, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, this, I think that there is a lot of creative capacity in people in this space that we can find more smooth, innovative ways for everybody to communicate and to be up to date on the projects that they love in the end of the day. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. So let's see what, what this happens, like what happens with this subject the next year. Ask the same question next year and we'll see <laughs> will everybody have Discord and Telegram groups that they ignore. I hope not. Mm -hmm. Certainly hope not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll just kind of add in this other kind of question from from um, Ryan, which is sort of related, I suppose. Um, but if any people want to talk about community, we can continue to do that. So uh, Ryan says, can you recommend any learning platforms uh, using NFT utility examples to assist when explaining NFTs to family and friends? Um, so does, any, does, it, does anyone have any sort of good examples of um, kind of uh, you know introductions to NFTs or anything like that? Um, anyone want to jump in on that one? Anything that kind of springs to mind? Well, I, I, I can say, go I'm ahead. Go, <laughs> go on, go on, Leela, you go first. Well, I, do, I mean, I don't want to, but our no. is focused on not in the space, can find a space to learn. Actually, can you hear me? Yeah. You, you're, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so um, that is, I mean, that, is something we focus on because we know that not everyone can join the Discord group and understand what's happening from the group. Mm. Yes, self promotion time. So yeah, yeah go for it. of course, uh, that's why we built uh, nftevening.com. Um, we were focusing on news at the moment, but we recently started to make uh, you know weekly interviews to give exposure to companies and artists as well. Um, other than that, I think there is lots of good tutorial on YouTube. Uh, DCL blogger mm -hmm. is a good one. Uh, I mean, you know, like video is also a good medium for uh, senior, more senior people uh, to learn from from us. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone on the on the game side? Are there any good good resources there? Yourselves, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go to our websites. I, mean, <laughs> I, I have a wiki, although I don't know if we have a specific tutorial for NFTs. Just general information, definitions, and stuff. Hmm. Hmm. It's quite difficult now. Whereas maybe six months ago, basically the kind of yeah the go-to place was OpenSea, which obviously has its own sort of um, kind of a uh, tutorial pages or famously the NFT Bible. I don't know if they've updated it recently, uh, but that was quite good. But but now I guess we have, sort of every blockchain has its own sort of NFT marketplaces, and then then you're sort of going through the whole thing of what's this blockchain? How do I set up a wallet? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost the uh, the success of the NFT. Uh, as a concept means everyone's doing them, which obviously makes the kind of the um, education part of it sort of sort of much harder um, 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 to do. Uh, here's another good question here from Yoshi. Actually, uh, uh, what are the killer applications of NFTs outside of gaming? So, I guess we, we have a lot of gamer people here. Any of the gamer people, um, George? What do you think? Uh, killer applications of NFTs outside of gaming? We've already Theo spoken about kind of. Um, Kind of real estate um, and kind of rental systems. Anything, anything outside of gaming that kind of has, has caught your attention? Outside of gaming, okay. NFTs is the next ownership standard, right? So we are talking about use cases that we haven't even imagined. I mean, we are talking about thousands, if not millions, of ways to use non fungible tokens. 
uh, Legadology is the next ownership standard, which means that it proves you own something. Whether this is uh, real estate, for example, whether it's memberships, like uh, I know Crypto and Gamers was one of the very first to issue a membership, right? It was an ERC-1155 token. They were the first to issue a membership. And on the other on the other side on the other hand we were the first to issue an authenticity token for some upper real so what one use one use case for example it, it can be an nft or it can be a fungible token but it, it can be token for something that you bought whether this is uh, a t-shirt whether this is a, a painting for example which proves that this comes from the original author uh, and there are like thousands of use cases, uh, tickets for conferences, like even they, they are talking about tokenizing the stock market, which will be like very good and uh, it will cut down the expenses by a lot for the stock market, right? Uh, in, in a few years, we, we're going to see government adopting non-fungible tokens. You have a house or something, you own this. You have the NFT, which is issued by the government. It won't take long for this to happen. Like, uh, as you all saw, made uh, Bitcoin a public tender a few days ago. So we are actually doing some baby steps, but adoption is coming. Adoption is here. So we're going to see millions of use cases. NFTs will change the way we interact with each other. It will change the way we own stuff. Mm. So that, that's my view on and on tokens. Mm. Yeah, it's got an interesting kind of a specific case actually. Um, that um, uh, so 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 if people are interested in, in DeFi, the uh, the new version of Uniswap, uh, Uniswap yeah. version three. Uh, now, basically, you, when you lock in your liquidity pool tokens, because of the way they've restructured it, and it's much more advanced in how you kind of set up your how your tokens are traded. Um, every every liquidity pool. Uh, token now is now now an nft so um that just i think is interesting obviously it's very complex for people and people who are not into blockchain are not gonna <laughs> sort of get it but but um but effectively there you're, you're, you're sort of getting a um a sort of a banking instrument that that i imagine is probably already happening that that kind of you know some investors are kind of setting this setting, setting these up you know they put in a thousand dollars of value or whatever it is ten thousand dollars of value and then obviously you can buy that nft it has that token value locked in there and then some sort of overall kind of percentage that it's earning from the from the trading fees as well and so that's the sort of way of allowing people who wouldn't otherwise be able to to buy these sort of um you know uh sophisticated kind of trading uh kind of mechanics just you know, they just basically buy an nft and they don't have to probably they should worry about what's going on inside there but but, but fundamentally when you go to a sort of a you know a bank, a bank or financial advisor they're sort of doing that for you and it'll be interesting to see if that kind of a process allows people um to kind of have more control over over their kind of finances, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, sort of coming to the end now. Um, then, if anyone else wants to jump in on other non gaming NFT applications, uh, I yeah. agree with George. Go. Okay. Yeah, luxury. Go uh, we we are seeing luxury brands, you know, that have issue with counterfeited items that are starting to use it as well, and I think that will be one of the uh, most common application in the next few years. Like if you think about Rolex, for example, like lots of uh, counterfeited Rolex in China, for example. I mean, it's it's a good way for uh, any any customer to uh, resell it on the secondary market and and basically prove that you know it's a real one. Yeah, I'm going to jump on that. I think that uh, one of the unexpected aspects that we're going to see from NFTs is uh, identification. I know that there's so many projects running on this space right now of identification and origin tracking, uh, like Origin Trail and so many others. But I think NFTs are going to play a role in that as well, in the way that people are going to own their identity. You know, self ownership is a thing that is currently not allowed for us to, to even have, to dream of, you know. And I think that in, uh, in the modern state, we're going to see that. Like we're going to see people claiming self-ownership and using an NFT to really prove who they are. Not just the items that they own, but 
truly own their identity. And I hope we see that. Mm -hmm. I think we're sort of coming up to time now. I'm just trying to see uh, if we should be should be stopping. I guess we probably <laughs> probably should be stopping. Um, so let's uh, just quickly go. Uh, final questions. Uh, cross platform NFTs. Yes, definitely think that's happening. Um, everyone from different companies is sharing together publicly, not completing. Will this trend continue? Nah, uh, we'll, we'll wait and see. I guess on that one, Duncan. Um, I guess at the moment, still blockchain. Blockchains tend to be open source, so I guess they're going to be a bit more. Uh, it, it makes sense for people to share stuff rather than try and compete, although obviously to, to a degree blockchains compete against each other. Um, lots of other questions, can't really cover them all now. I, I think we'll sort of wrap it up. Um, so uh, just to say thank you very much to our panellists. Do you want to uh, say uh, say your goodbye? Thank you, uh, Leela. Thank you guys for having me. This has been great. Uh, just, just remind us, where, where should people go to be checking out uh, checking out your uh, what you do? 